Good morning, everyone. Today I'll be talking about age-friendly health systems and the four M's. So these are today's learning objectives to understand about population aging and how older adults have unique needs, to learn about the concept of age-friendly health systems, and then to learn about the four M's. Those are what matters, medication, mentation or mind, and mobility. So I'll just start out with a little bit of background on aging. Currently, there are over 54 million people over the age of 65 in the United States, and they represent over 16% of the population. Now, these projections are pretty dramatic. In 2040, it's estimated we'll have 80 million, and in 2060, 95 million adults over the age of 65. So this is definitely something that's going to be growing and growing as time goes on. Now, in Hawaii, we're very lucky. In addition to having almost perfect weather and wonderful people around us, we also have the longest life expectancy in the United States. And just for interest, I put down the top 10 states and the, top, and the bottom 10 states for life expectancy in the little box on the right. You can see Hawaii is right on the top of the list. So just a little background about population growth. Here on the left, this is what happened in 1960. And this graph on the right is the projection to 2060. On this axis, we have age groups. So we start out with 0 to 4, so children, and then going all the way through adulthood, middle age, and then old age, and this top bar here is actually the super agers, the people who are 85 and over. And on this axis here, we just have numbers, millions of people. And on the left is men who are blue, and on the right is women in orange. And you can see in 1960, it was very much a pyramid, you know, where we had a big base of children and then as we grew older and older, there were less and less people and very few people in this oldest age group of 85 plus. We are already close to this, but not quite at this. But this is the projection for 2060. So you can see it's no longer a pyramid. It's more like a rectangle. And this is what we see not only in the United States, but in many other parts of the world. So life expectancy in the United States has been gradually increasing over the last century. There was one big blip, and that happened in the last two years because of COVID. So in 2020, life expectancy actually dropped by 1.8 years in the United States. This is definitely because of COVID. And I think the 2021 numbers are probably going to be quite similar. They haven't come out yet. This is the first time in many decades that we've actually seen a drop in life expectancy. Prior to that, it was pretty much a steady increase. We know that age-specific death rates increased from 2019 to 2020 for every group from 15 years of age and older. And COVID-19 was the third leading cause of death in 2020. We think actually that's probably an underestimate because not all deaths due to COVID were reported as such. So you can see this pandemic has had a huge effect on the aging of the population. Whether or not there'll be long-term effects, it's too soon to tell. Some demographers are worried that there may be some long-term effects as well. So then with aging, we definitely see increase in disability. So I'll go through this graph and I'm gonna orient you to it first. So each of these on this axis here, it's age groups starting with five to 17, 18 to 34, 35 to 64, 65 to 74 and 75 plus. And then these are different disabilities, hearing, vision, ambulatory that's walking, cognitive or thinking, independent living, and self-care. And I want you to just look at very little bit of disability in young ages, as expected, gradually increasing through adulthood, 
And certainly we see over the age of 65 and definitely over the age of 75, a huge increase. The dark green represent men and the light green represent women. So in hearing disability, that's the only disability where actually men do worse than women. So by the age of 75, it's almost 30% of men and almost 20% of women. When we get to vision, it's about 10% over the age of 75. Difficulty walking, somewhere between 25 and maybe 35% have difficulty walking. Cognitive or memory problems, it's somewhere between maybe 12 to 15%. With independent living, again, 20 to 30%. And with self-care, around 10 to 15% or so. So we definitely see changes in disability rates with aging. So I'll just go over some principles of geriatric assessment. We treat patients and approach them very differently from other physicians. That's what our fellows go into training for in geriatric medicine, to learn how to treat older people differently because they have such unique needs. Our goal is not necessarily to increase length of life, but it's more to pr promote wellness and independence. So our focus is on function, not on organ systems. And we look at all parts of the person, physical, cognitive, psychological, and social domains. Now, most older people have complex needs. So no one person, no one physician even, can take care of them well. So we need a whole team that works together. And our success is measured, again, not in length of life, but in maintaining or improving quality of life. Again, we focus on the whole person, not just an organ system. We want to enhance independence and quality of life. And in order to do that, we do a lot of preventive care. So we want to make sure that people have their vaccinations taken care of and other screening taken care of so things are picked up early. Rehab is incredibly important for older people. So many older people need rehab for various ailments. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, these are the geriatrician's best friends because it can make a huge difference in the life of an older person. On the other hand, for some patients, towards the end of life, palliative care may be necessary, and even hospice care. We had a wonderful talk on hospice earlier on in the series. And for some patients, that can be a real blessing, not only for the patient, but also for their family. And again, we do this with a team approach. So next, I'll segue to age-friendly health systems. What is this? This is a movement that is based on the premise that older people have unique needs. And it was actually created by four groups working in conjunction. The Johnny Hartford Foundation. This foundation is actually, uh, it's been around for very long and their focus has been on aging and education in aging, research in aging for many decades now. The Department of Geriatric Medicine at JAPSM is actually one of 25 centers of excellence in geriatrics designated by the Johnny Hartford Foundation. So I'm very proud about that. And our faculty have worked really hard to earn that designation. So the Hartford Foundation worked with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or the IHI, the American Hospital Association, and the Catholic Health Association of the US. And the goal of this movement is to prevent harm, improve outcomes, and to also lower costs. It seems paradoxical, right? How can you do all these good things and yet lower costs? Ironically, it is possible to do all of those things together. So this is a new way to organize care for older people. When I first heard about the age-friendly health systems, I was thinking like, wow, are they gonna change the way geriatric works? And actually they didn't. They just put it into a more organized framework for other people and other physicians and other disciplines to understand better and to implement better. And the goal is that these age-friendly health systems will be implemented in all settings. This will include clinics, home-based care, hospitals, nursing homes, literally every setting you can think of. The goal is that every single setting and every single healthcare institution in this country 
will eventually be providing age-friendly health care. The IHI has what they call the triple aim. They've had this now for a couple of decades. The triple aim of medicine, this is not just for geriatrics, it's for medicine overall, is to improve individual patient care, improve population health, in the same time, reducing the cost of care. And this age-friendly health system actually works really well with this paradigm. So again, these are the four M's. What matters, medication, mentation, and mobility. What matters is really the most important thing. All the other M's kind of circle around that. So what that means is we need to find out what matters most to the patient. And this can be extremely variable. We need to align the healthcare along with their own goals and make sure we take into consideration all of their preferences. Medication is important, we all know that, can cause a lot of problems. Mentation needs to be taken care of well. What use is a healthy body if our mind isn't working, right? We want all of the things to be working in sync. And then mobility. Everyone wants to remain independent and functional. So I'll start with the first and most important M, which is what matters. How do we find this out? Very simple, we have to ask our patients, what matters most to you? What matters most about healthcare, about different care preferences, about your life? Often patients will tell us, you know, my main goal is I want to stay alive until my granddaughter gets married. That's my main goal right now. Or I want to see my grandson play in his basketball game or something like that. We need to make sure we respect those wishes. We need to t talk about advanced healthcare directives, talk about post if appropriate. I'll be explaining these terms in the next couple of slides. And I always encourage patients, please discuss these things with your family. Because there's no point the patient telling us what they want, but the family having no clue. Because there may come a time when you may not be able to talk to your family about these things. So I know that a lot of people feel, oh, it's so uncomfortable to discuss this. Oh, it's bad luck to discuss this. And I say, no, it's not. You're really doing your kids a favor by talking about these things ahead of time. Because then when there's a crisis, they won't be as stressed out. So you're really doing this for them to make sure first that they're understanding you, they're in sync with you, and that they will respect your wishes. So all other M's, again, revolve around what matters. This is an advanced healthcare directive form. Now, you'll see many examples of these, and it's completely OK to use other types of forms. These are directive instructions and desires that a person communicates regarding their medical decision making. What would they want if certain situations happened? And this only applies under certain conditions. So for example, I have had an advanced directive since I was in my 20s. Fortunately, I've never needed to use it because to this point, I've always been able to speak for myself, express my own wishes. But if all these years, if something had happened, I was in an accident, I was in a coma, something else bad happened to me. There was a written document that stated to my doctors, to my family, to the hospital, what my wishes would be. So if you look at this form on the left over here, it says the statements only apply in certain situations. If I'm close to death and life support would only postpone the moment of my death or if I'm in an unconscious state, such as an irreversible coma or a persistent vegetative state, and it's unlikely I will become conscious, or if I have brain damage or brain disease that makes me unable to make healthcare decisions. So the advanced care directive won't come into effect until one of those criteria are met. And then it asks you about various things. Do I want to have my life prolonged? Do I want CPR? Do I want tube feeding? Do I want relief from pain, et cetera, et cetera? So this is what an advanced care directive tells, tells us. 
These can be either written or oral. I really recommend written is better because, you know, with oral directives, people can misremember. And different people can hear different things and they may not remember it the same. So to avoid argument between family members, it's so much better if you kind of write it down. So the advanced directive form, I think, is really good. It could even be a letter. But the form is nice because it makes you, forces you to think about certain things. It could even be expressed verbally to a physician who documents these wishes. So I've had patients in the past where I've really encouraged them, I would like you to do an advanced directive form. I've given them a blank form. I've talked to them about it. And they say, OK, I'll take it home. I'll talk to my kids, and I'll bring it back. And they never bring it back. And so I ask them, tell me your wishes. And I write down. I try and write down in quotation marks. So I'm using their words. That is a legal document. So if they never do an advanced health care plan, and if sometime down the road somebody needs to look it up, they can look at my medical record, and that's actually a legal document, what I wrote down. So again, we encourage physicians, if the patient doesn't do a written document, at least you can write down their wishes. This is also very important. In addition to an advanced health care plan, to have a durable medical uh, power of attorney for health care. The reason for this is not everything can be predicted on that form. You know, there are so many possibilities of things get, that can happen, and there's no way you can write down every single possibility. So this way, you're picking somebody that you really trust, who's close to you, who knows your philosophy of life, and they're the ones who will be empowered to make decisions for you when the time comes. So this could be one or more people to be your agent. It could be your spouse. It could be an adult child. It could even be a friend or any other trusted person. It doesn't have to be a relative even, but it needs to be somebody who knows you well. It should not be the employee of the healthcare facility unless they're related to you. So you shouldn't be naming your doctor or a nurse as the healthcare proxy unless they're also your relative. This document does have to be signed and witnessed or notarized. So there are a few steps you need to take, but it's very useful to have this as well. Now, POLST, which stands for Provider Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, is a little bit different. This is the form, and it's, this is the color of the form that it's on. It's in this very vivid, vibrant lime green color. And there's a reason for that. They designed it this way so that it's very easy to find. So we tell people the POLST needs to be posted somewhere in your house. Most people post it either on the refrigerator or they'll post it on the back of the front door, somewhere where if paramedics are called, they will find it easily. They don't have to go hunting for it because they'll be in a rush. So this is actually a physician or nurse practitioner's order. It specifies the types of treatment that a seriously ill person wants right now. And this is very useful for first responders and EMS. So for example, I'll go through this a little bit. Part A is basically asking about cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So this is if your heart stops beating, if you stop breathing, do you want to be brought back? Do you want them to do CPR and give electric shocks to your heart and put in a tube to put you on a breathing machine? If you say no, if the paramedics come to your house, they will not attempt CPR. If they don't find this, and if you have an advanced directive, they will not follow that, because the advanced directive is kind of for the future. This is an actual physician's order that's applicable right now. So if that's something you're worried about, that you don't want to have CPR performed on you, you really need to have this post. And it needs to be very, very clear where it is. So it needs to be visible so that paramedics can find it right away. The next B is basically for medical interventions about do you want comfort measures, limited or full treatment. C talks about artificial nutrition, like tube feeding. And then D gives you signatures and a whole bunch of other things. So just to compare side by side, advanced directives and post. Advanced directives are for all adults. I think everyone, no matter how old or young, should be having this. 
again, I made this in my 20s because there have been some very bad cases that have been in the media where it's been young people who've had a catastrophic event. It could be a stroke or it could be a head injury, something like that. And they've had a big event and then there's a lot of controversy about what type of care to give them. Whereas a post is really reserved for persons with advanced illness. There's no age restriction because you can have end-stage disease, unfortunately, even in childhood. So this is more for serious disease where you need an order right now. The purpose of an advanced directive is to express your values, to appoint your future decision maker, and is really to express your wishes for the future compared to the post, which is right now, this is what I want. Today, if somebody shows up at my door, this is what I would like. The advanced directive, the EMS, the, uh, the paramedics who come to your door will not respect this, whereas they will respect the post. In the hospital, both will be honored. But again, if you have serious illness, please get the post. Oh, just to let you know, the post needs to be signed by the patient, but also by the physician and the nurse or nurse practitioner. So this is something you really need to talk to your doctor about. OK, moving on then to medications. We know that older people use a disproportionate percent of medication. So even though they're about 16% of the population, they use over a third of prescription medications. Over 90% of older people are taking at least one medication. And polypharmacy or taking multiple medications, unfortunately, is common. Sometimes we see patients like this. This is one patient's medications. It seems ridiculous, like is there enough time in the day to take that many? But sometimes patients do take a lot. Drug interactions and side effects are more common with aging and also more common when you take more medications. So this is something we're very careful about. So to define successful drug therapy, it's the right drug at the right dose for the right condition and for the right patient and for their goals of care. And failure in any of these can lead to adverse drug events, or ADE. Unfortunately, these are common. They're responsible for 700,000 ER visits every year and 120,000 hospitalizations in the United States. So a very common problem, also very expensive. Three and a half billion dollars are spent so it's not just the financial cost, it's also the human cost. Because obviously when these things happen, patients are suffering, their families are suffering. The sad thing is many of these are actually preventable. And so some of them are not. Some people can have an adverse drug reaction. There's no way to predict it. It was the correct dose, it was the correct patient, it was just they had an allergy to it, or they just had an unfortunate side effect that nobody could prevent. But some, many of them are preventable, and so we should do a better job in preventing those. And we know that older people are more prone to these adverse drug events. So geriatricians in particular, a lot of what we do is stop medications or cut the dose of medications. We tend to do that a lot. And guess what? The patient gets better. So these are the risk factors for adverse drug events. Advanced age higher number of medications. Now remember, this can include prescription meds, but also over-the-counter meds, and even what we call herbal supplements. Many people believe because they are plant-based or natural, they must be safe, not necessarily. We know digitalis, which is a strong, potent heart medicine, is actually derived from the foxglove plant. There are many other medications that are powerful medications that are derived from plants. I also want to kind of caution you because many of these herbal medications can make a lot of claims because they're not regulated by the FDA. So they haven't been gone through rigorous clinical trials like prescription medications have. And so I, that really worries me. And I always tell patients, please tell your doctors what you're taking. Even if it's just even ointments, even drops, those kinds of things. Make sure you tell them everything that you're taking because some things can interact with others. 
if there's a prior adverse drug event, the person is at risk for a future one as well, especially if it's the same drug, drug class or something related. Alcohol and other drugs can worsen the risk. So can low body weight. And we have a lot of people in Hawaii, particularly, who are really small. You know, at baseline, they weigh 90 pounds. So you can imagine that they might be at higher risk for adverse events as well. And then, of course, poor liver function, because drugs are metabolized in the liver, broken down in the liver or poor kidney function, because drugs are excreted or gotten rid of from the kidneys, both of those can also increase the risk of adverse drug events. So these are my rules for drug use in the elderly. First one is start low and go slow. Once the medication is in the body, often you just have to wait for time to get rid of it. In the meantime, the patient may be really groggy or may be falling. So it's better to start slowly and then gradually increase rather than doing it suddenly. We always have to look at risk and benefit. Another thing is don't quit too soon. For example, with antidepressants, it can take a long time to see an effect. So people might take it for two, three days and say it's not working. Well, it won't work that quickly. You need to take it longer. So you have to be patient as well. Always monitor for side effects. I try to avoid starting two drugs at the same time. Now, obviously, there are times when you have to start more than two even. Sometimes when somebody's acutely ill, when they're in the hospital, often they'll have many drugs started at the same time. But if it's something stable in the outpatient setting, I'd rather start one at a time. That way, if there is a side effect, I'll know which one it was from. And then this last one is actually my own. It's my roller coaster rule. Those of you who've known me know I really love roller coasters, and so do my family. So I like these crazy ones, by the way, that fling you all over the place. My husband and I, many years ago, we made this decision, like, we won't ride a roller coaster in the first year that it's built. And there's a reason for that, right? Many of the problems are discovered in that first year. We've broken that rule. I'm going to tell you that. I'm confessing now. We have broken that rule because we got tempted. You know, we'd go to an amusement park and we'd look at it and we'd go, oh, it looks so good. We're never going to come back here. Let's just go. So we have been tempted and broken the rule, but we try not to do it if we can. I have that same rule for older people and medications. In general, when the first year when it's out, I try not to start my patients on brand new medications. Again, there are exceptions. When the first Alzheimer medication came out, of course I wanted to try it. There was nothing else to use, so of course I did. But if it's something like for high blood pressure, or for diabetes, or for asthma, if there's a new medication, I'd rather not try it out on my frail older person first. I'd rather wait until more side effects are defined before I start an older frail person on it. So we always ask these questions, or we should be asking these questions, is the medication necessary? What are the goals and endpoints? Sometimes our goal may not be the same for somebody who's 85 as somebody who's 45. So for example, for blood pressure or for blood sugar for diabetes, my goal may be different for a middle-aged person or for an older person. In a frail older person, I might be okay with letting the sugars be a little bit higher or the blood pressure being a little bit higher, because I don't want to risk it dropping too low and causing fainting spells or other problems. Always ask, do the benefits outweigh the risks? Are you treating the effects of another drug? I don't like doing that. I don't like treating side effects of one drug with another drug. I'd rather pull back on that first drug instead. Could one drug be used for two conditions? Sometimes we can. And then always think about drug and disease interactions. The next M is mentation or mind. So the goals here are to prevent, identify, treat, dementia, depression, and delirium across all settings of care, all the things that affect our brain. I'll start with dementia. What is this? This is when somebody has cognitive problems that are acquired. So this is not congenital. It's not mental retardation. It needs to be somebody who had normal cognition before, and now we see a change. 
We see deficits in memory. That's the most prominent thing. But it's not just memory. It's also other cognitive domains, things like language, visual spatial ability, attention, executive function, all of those things. It needs to be bad enough that it affects your social or occupational functioning, so your interactions with family and friends or your job performance. And we see an absence of delirium, which is an acute state, which I'll talk about later, and also major psychiatric disorders like, oops, major psychiatric disorders like depression. Dementia is an umbrella diagnosis. Under this umbrella comes Alzheimer's disease, vascular or stroke-related dementia, and many other subtypes of dementia. These are the two most common. Alzheimer's by far the most common, and stroke-related is the next most common. 13% of those over the age of 65 have dementia, and it's almost half in people over the age of 85. So it's definitely an age-related disease. Not age-inevitable, but definitely age-related. We see this geometric increase in prevalence. After the age of 60, the prevalence of dementia doubles every five years. And people live with it for a very long time, particularly with Alzheimer's disease. People can live with it for decades sometimes, even 20, 25, or more years. It's a major cause of disability, and it's the primary reason for institutionalization. So if we look at long-term care, nursing home care in the US, not rehab, but nursing home care, we know that over 80% of those patients are there because of dementia. And it's a very expensive disease, over $300 billion in direct care costs and the same amount for lost productivity by the family. So these are the factors that are very important in maintaining brain health. And we need to do these all the time, by the way, not wait until old age. These need to start in middle age or even in young adulthood. Be physically active, socially and mentally active, have good nutrition, and reduce risk factors for heart disease. We know there's a huge heart-brain connection. So things that are bad for the heart are also bad for the brain. Things like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, being physically inactive, obese, things like that. Depression is a medical condition that causes mood changes with persistent feelings of sadness and loss of interest. So it can affect how you feel, think, and act in daily life, and it can affect your functioning as well can cause problems with relationships. It needs to be present most of the day, nearly every day, for at least two weeks. It's not like, oh, I'm feeling a little sad today. This needs to be a persistent kind of state in order to be caused a clinical depression. Delirium, on the other hand, is an acute change. This is an acute confusional state. It comes on over hours and days. Not like dementia. Alzheimer's comes on over months, years. This one comes on quickly. We see a clouding of consciousness, so somebody can be very lethargic or hyper alert. We see waxing and waning. They can be really good one minute and really bad the other and kind of bouncing off the walls. We see a very severe attention deficit to the point where sometimes you can't even have a conversation with these patients. And they have an alteration in their sleep-wake cycle. This condition is common in the hospital. And the people who are at highest risk are people in old age and who have an underlying dementia. So this is where somebody who was doing OK, now they're in the hospital, and they're completely confused. Fortunately, it does get better, but it is a very serious condition that needs to be handled well. So the last M is mobility. We want to make sure people maintain function and independence. I'll go over these terms, activities of daily living or ADLs, and instrumental activity of daily living or IADLs. We want to prevent falls, and we want to provide team care with occupational, physical therapy, speech and language pathology, and others taking care of these patients. These are the ADLs, activities of daily living. Bathing, grooming yourself, going to the toilet, eating, dressing, transferring, getting out of bed, walking around, the things you do every day. 
Instrumental activities of daily living are more complex tasks, things like cooking, cleaning the house, taking your medications, laundry, shopping, taking care of your checkbook and finances, take, making telephone calls and transportation. I thought this was cute. The adverse effects of medical school on ADLs. These are not old people, these are young medical students. Not many medical students, real medical students. And you can see their ADLs don't look great. They don't dress well, they don't eat well. Sometimes they barely transfer. This guy doesn't smell too good, I think. Haven't been to the bathroom for a long time. So have some incontinence problems. So <laughs> I thought that was cute. Fall prevention is really important. Falls are a serious threat to older people. The CDC has this really cool program called the STEADY program. I guess that's a good take, right, on being steady and preventing falls. But it stands for Stopping Elderly Accidents, Deaths, and Injuries. The core elements are screening, assessing, and intervening. We know one in four people over the age of 65 falls every year. So this is a very costly disease, $50 billion annually. And it is a preventable disease. So the study asks some screening questions about balance and gait. It identifies risk factors. Are there some medications that put you at risk for what we call orthostatic hypotension? This is where your blood pressure is normal when you're lying down. You stand up, your blood pressure drops, and you can plop over. Are there home hazards? Are there rugs to trip over or cords to trip over? How's the vision? How's your footwear? How's your diet? Are there other conditions like depression or osteoporosis? Vision is so important, right? Every time I get a new pair of glasses, for that first few days, I'm, I'm unsteady because the floor looks like it's uneven, you know? So until I get used to my new glasses. Can you imagine if you had a permanent vision problem? Walking can be very hazardous. Footwear, ladies. Wear rubber sole shoes, please, no high heels. It's really important. Forget the vanity, you don't want to fall. For intervention, there are prevention programs with education, diet, and exercise, addressing risk factors, and then doing physical therapy, and even a home safety evaluation. I really like that. Uh, over here in Hawaii, either physical or occupational therapy will come to the home and will give you recommendations about maybe you should put grab bars or lighting or other hazards to get rid of. So I'm just gonna end with the American Geriatric Society actually added a fifth M. They decided four is not enough for us, we're gonna go for five. So they added multi-complexity, which describes the whole person, typically an older adult living with multiple chronic conditions, advanced illness, with or without complicated biosocial needs. So in summary then, the age-friendly health systems and the four M's are kind of the direction our country is moving in for care of older people. Just an update in Hawaii, the Queen's Health System and the Palimomi Family Medicine Clinic have both been now, they both received certification by the IHI as a level two age-friendly health system, which is the highest level possible. So we're really proud of that. And actually, faculty in my department help these two systems gain this IHI recognition. We hope to do more and more. We're working right now with a KKV clinic, the Kokua Kalihi Valley Clinic, and we're going to be working with other uh, health centers as well. Well, thank you all for your attention, and now I'll be ready to take some questions.